So uh, as I mentioned, the ventral pathway is involved in conscious perception and in object recognition. So uh, how are we going to think about all of that? Um, so we're here now. So very loosely, remember the pathway we started with, the retinal ganglion cells, right? Uh, their axons go up to the LGN, make one synapse, go up to primary visual cortex. This is all deep down in the middle of the brain. Um, and remember that the retinal ganglion cells and the la lateral geniculate cells have these um, center surround receptive field organizations, right? They like small dots that either increase in light or decrease in light. Remember that the reason they like small dots rather than uniform illumination or the way, the, the way that's manifest is they have these inhibitory surrounds in their receptive fields. So if you show them a big open expanse of light or dark, they don't care. They care about things that are different than their surroundings, okay? Either brighter than their surroundings or darker than their surroundings. Does everybody remember that? Okay, so that's the small dots. That's what these guys are sensitive to. And then remember when you get up to primary visual cortex, you find uh, selectivity for orientation cells that like this orientation, not that orientation, okay? So you can see we're sort of building up the kind of complexity of what those cells like or respond to selectively, okay? We already saw that going from the LGN up to V1, right? And I gave you that proposed wiring diagram for how you can take a bunch of, um, of lateral geniculate cells, each with each responding to little dots of light, align them in a row and get an orientation detector, right? So that's a, a possibility about how you compute the, this orientation selectivity in V1. And the basic standard view of the ventral visual pathway is that it's a whole bank of, of processors that basically increase, that, that, that extend this um, property, putting together more and more uh, complex parts and building up selectivity for really very complex visual shapes. Okay, so everybody see as, just as you go from dots to lines, you could and a few lines of different orientations and get a detector for an angle. Does that make sense to everybody? And then you could take a bunch of angles and and them together at the next layer of processing and get a more complex shape detector. Okay, so that's a basic view about what's going on down that ventral pathway as you go from primary visual cortex down the temporal lobe. Okay. It's mostly an idea. There's some bits of evidence. We'll talk about little bits of it, okay? But I want you to get the broad strokes idea first. And of course, there's a lot of computational modeling, which is also getting short shrift. I tried to fit it in this lecture and just decided I would drive everybody crazy going too fast. But there are lots of computational models that take that idea and say, okay, let's build a model with you know, simulated neurons in series of um, layers, each processing the information in the previous layer that basically do this, okay? So those kinds of computational models have been around for 20 years or so, and all of a sudden recently, fancier versions of those computational models that use um, uh, convolutional neural networks are getting really powerful. But it's all variations of the same idea. A higher, a, a series of processing stages, each building on the previous one, getting more and more complex selectivities as you go up the system, okay? okay. So that's just loose talk. Um, what is the evidence for this? Uh, well, let's look at one bit of evidence. There's this little region here called LOC the, that the claim here is it responds to basic shapes. So what is that evidence? Let's talk about this region. Okay, so here is LOC in one subject. Again, I think I said this before, but in case not, when you see these funny looking modeled brains, that's a mathematically inflated brain, so you can see the whole cortical surface. Remember, the cortex is all folded up inside the head. So if you just look at the outside without mathematically undoing it, there's all kinds of good stuff that might be inside a fold. We want to see all of that, so we mathematically inflate it so we can see all the stuff. The dark bits are the bits that were inside a fold before that got mathematically inflated. Everybody got that? Okay, so what you see here is a region in the uh, right and left hemispheres on both sides that in me is right about there. It's on the bottom surface or a lateral bottom surface of the brain um, near the back. Um, and what it does is it responds more to shapes than junk. That's the simple statement. Here's one of the early experiments. They just showed photographs of objects 
um, and textures. And they found that this region, called lateral occipital complex, because it's on the lateral surface, it's still in the occipital lobe, uh, and I guess it's complex. <laughs> it's actually a, it's not like a nice, neat little oval in the brain. It's like a whole mush. You can see some of it here. It ext extends on the bottom surface a bit as well. Anyway, it's a chunk of brain that likes shapes compared to junk. All right? Now, that's just a simple statement of what it likes. You, you, there are all kinds of stories you guys can already come up with. You know, so if I say this is a mid-level shape processing region, you guys can come up with all kinds of alternative accounts to that, just based on these data. Right? However, there are lots of experiments that have been done, and actually the evidence is really quite good that it's, that it's interested in shapes. I'll show you a little bit more in a second. OK, oh, also importantly, this region does not respond more strongly to shapes that are familiar versus shapes that aren't. OK, so if this is a sculpture you haven't seen before, the response of your LO when you look at it is about the same as when you look at this cat or any other thing that you can identify. Maybe. But keep in mind that in both cases, you see the shape of the thing. Right? So you may not know what that is. You may not even know that it's a sculpture from this lousy little photograph. But you could build it out of clay. You can see its three-dimensional shape. And so what that suggests, doesn't nail, but suggests, is that this LO region is not about matching to some stored representation of what cats look like or what anything else looks like. It's giving you a, an internal description of the shape of the thing. Does that make sense? Uh, another, many, many experiments have been done on this region. Here's another one. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on here, but here's a photograph. And what you do is you chop it into bits of different sizes, and then you rearrange the bits. Okay, this is called scrambling. Okay, so you scramble it to different degrees. Okay, and what you see is, and then you measure the response in LO. So this is functional MRI response in LO to these different kinds of images. And what you see is it likes the whole images much more than the garbage. That's what I showed you before. But now this experiment asks, well, how much of the object needs to be there? It's a kind of low-tech, simple way of saying, how complex are the features that it responds to? And the answer is, it really likes the whole thing. But it likes the kind of you know, large chunks of the thing almost as well. Everybody see that? OK. So that doesn't totally nail it, but you see it gives you a little more insight about what it likes. OK, so this is just like a puzzle. We don't know until we just try lots of different things and see what it responds to. OK? Now, um, we can contrast this response in LO to those shapes to what you see in V1. What do you think you see in V1 in the same experiment? Is the response going to look like that? What's it going to look like? So main point is that the pattern of response in V1 is very different from the pattern of response in LO, entirely consistent with the idea that LO is one or two processing stages up the, up the processing chain from V1 after these uh, selectivities have been compounded and ended and, and put together to make more complex uh, elements of shape. Make sense? OK. All right, so all of that suggests that the response properties, yes, Andrea, is it? Yeah. Of Claudia. But when you said that this response, like this is just one line, right? So is, is this like an average or something? Yeah, yes, it's a good question. So what I talked about before with orientation selectivity was an electrode in a monkey brain sitting right next to an oriented bar. It likes this orientation, not that orientation. Okay, but now when we suddenly skip to functional MRI, remember there's about a half a million neurons in each voxel. And this is much worse than that because now we've taken about 100 voxels in LO, and we've just averaged across them. So all we're saying is if we average over all those cells that like all these different orientations, or all of these different shape properties, um, we get some average response like this. That's a very impoverished view on what the actual neural code is doing. right? So we'll get, in a, it, if I go fast enough, at the end of the lecture, we'll get to a kind of vivid depiction of some of the ways that these kinds of um, measures of, of the functional MRI response make it very hard to see what the actual neural code is doing. It's such an averaged, pooled response that we're looking at that it's very hard to tell. Nonetheless, it's different in ways that are suggestive. Make sense? Okay, 
All of this suggests that LO is doing some kind of mid-level shape representation. We don't know exactly wh what. We don't know if it's 2D or 3D. There are lots of things we don't know. But something a little more complex than just responding to edges. Does that tell us that it's necessary for shape perception? You guys have already seen data in this lecture. Patient DF, right? Patient DF has a shape processing deficit. Patient DF's damage is in that ventral pathway that we're talking about now. So let's look. Where exactly is patient DF's lesion? OK, so this is patient DF, just to remind you. OK, here's another depiction of LO from another study showing you that same lateral occipital thing and showing you that it continues a little bit onto the ventral surface. This is normal subject's functional MRI. Now we want to know, where is DF's lesion? Boom. That's DF's lesion. Pretty amazing, isn't it? It's really similar. It's so similar, I think there's a little bit of a cheat here, but it's more or less right. It's right in that same zone. OK, so this tells us, this goes together really nicely. We know that that region responds to, mid -level, to shapes more than visual garbage. And we know that if you lose that region, your conscious shape perception, at least, is, is really messed up. OK? So that suggests that it's not only activated by shapes, but necessary for shape perception. Everybody got that? OK. Um, all right, so now. Here's where we are in, in simple caricature. Side view of the brain, bottom view of the brain. In the last lecture, I spent a bunch of time talking about visual area MT, which is approximately right there. Okay? Um, visual area MT responds more to moving stuff than stationary stuff. Cells in MT in monkeys are direction selective. I showed you that uh, video of uh, the direction selective cell that responds when a line goes like that through its receptive field, not when a line like that go, goes through its receptive field in the opposite direction. I showed you that single neurons in there are tuned to direction of motion. Um, and uh, I think I ran out of time for this, but I, I should have mentioned that if you have damage, there's only a couple cases in the literature where you have damage to visual area MT, and those people have something called akinetopsia. A means lack of kina, like kinetics. They don't have motion perception, akinetopsia is the op optical, right? No motion vision, OK? So they can see fine. They can recognize shapes. They can get around in the world. But they don't see visual motion. It's apparently extremely weird. Apparently, it's very hard to, say, pour water into a glass and know when the glass is going to be full, because you have kind of all these snapshots. You don't see this motion that enables you to extrapolate. When is this going to be done? Apparently, it's hard to cross streets because you see cars, you know they're moving because at one point they're here and another point they're here, but it's very hard to extrapolate when are they going to be here. Okay? Uh, and that strengthens the evidence that goes along. Remember, I showed you guys the motion after effect? That was right at the end of the lecture. I was running out of time. That was from Visual Motion Area MT. I showed it responds more to moving dots, moving rings, and stationary rings. And when you have a, a motion percept from an after effect, the signal persists in, in motion area MT. You stick the coil right there. there. With TMS, the effects tend to be very subtle. So it's not like, wow, I can't see anything moving at all. It's more like my accuracy on saying whether the motion is in this direction or that direction goes from 78% correct to 75% correct. Right? So effect sizes are tiny. Um, but it's still cool, right? OK, so, um, so, so that's evidence that this region is involved in motion. I just told you a bunch of evidence that this region, LO, is involved in shape perception. And on Wednesday, Rosa will give you evidence that a region approximately here is involved in processing color information. Okay? So this is vastly oversimplified. Each of these regions does a little bit of some other stuff. Uh, none of them is a neat little oval in the brain. They're kind of mucky things with rough edges and all of that. But, but there's clearly some division of labor for these mid-level features of motion, shape, and color. Okay, Here's a little puzzle. Uh, patients who lose that region, as Rosa will tell you more on Wednesday, um, lose their ability to perceive color. The world is pretty much grayscale to them. That's called achromatopsia, analogous to akinetopsia, motion deficit. This is a color deficit. OK. So here's a weird empirical finding. It's been known for a long time that 
that achromatopsia, it's very rare, but when people get achromatopsia, they often also have prosopagnosia. What does that tell you? Remember what prosopagnosia is? We spend a lot of time talking about it. That's exactly what you'd expect if they're next door. Boom, and they are. Okay? So remember, I said, it, you might infer from that, oh, there's no distinction in the brain between face processing and motion processing, because they're right next door. Or, or, or because when you have a lesion uh, in, in, uh, in there, you get deficits in both. But the alternative account is, maybe they're right next door, and any lesion that hits one is likely to hit the other. Okay? And that's actually the case, as, as multiple lines of evidence now show.